Hello, my name is John Russos, and this is a toast to my naivety. It's all brought to you by the Here's My Thing podcast. This is episode five of 10, going on a date after being severely disappointed. Enjoy. I had to turn off my phone today. Well, first I, had, I turned it to vibrate, then I turned it off. A, a group chat turned into a frenzy over Halloween plans and costumes. It started with someone saying that they were planning on being a parrot and just wanted to double check that no one else was gonna be a parrot too. Today at the coffee shop, a boy, he he might've been four, I think four or five, he was dressed in overalls. He was brought along by his mother. I think she bribed him with the power of choice, that if he came, He could pick from the armory of treats that's staled in the glass box by the register because what does a coffee shop offer him? There are no coloring mats with crayons, only people with facial piercings and attitudes. He might only know it as a place that smells like whatever lingers off his uncle's breath, a place where people who don't shy away from the plaid patterns go to dig their fingers into their temples and glare at their computer screens. He chose a vegan sugar cookie. I don't think he knows it was vegan because I don't think his mom cared to explain to him what that meant as that would then require a conversation about morals and and GI stuff, a conversation not meant for cafes, but places like longer car rides with cheeky rays of sun that peek into back seats. She got something entirely more complicated, but I think just as fundamentally flawed as a vegan sugar cookie. It required pumps of things and liquids needed to be foamed. It tested the stamina of the espresso machine and the patience of the barista. She wore sunglasses with frames the size of church pane windows, the way they would go down to her mouth, of which I saw she extended into a soft smile as if enjoying some sort of sick thrill and watching the poor lipped ring man assemble her drink while waiting the child picked at the cookie, which I think because it was vegan and crumbled something so similar to a Nature Valley bar. It wasn't until the barista started to sculpt at the drink's foam that the boy pointed up above the espresso machine to the tank of coffee beans. He said nothing. He only further showcased this lack of fine motor skills, the way he bent his finger while he pointed, how he contorted his body just to make the effort. His mom said, Those are coffee beans. They make the drink. How many beans? He asked back a good question. The mom said she wasn't sure, but encouraged him to guess. He thought for a moment. He stopped pointing, and instead he held his arm out and bent it at a 90-degree angle. He puffed out his chest and threw in a facial expression that one might wear if they felt a drop in their lower intestines. 20 or 100, he replied. The mom played along. Yeah, or maybe even a few hundred. The boy shook his head, and I think he actually might have even added a chuckle for theatrics and said... No. More than 100 is too much. And for whatever reason, that made perfect sense. If someone asks for my takeaways from this experience, I'm not sure what I might say. I'm I'm not sure right now, that is. I, I imagine the lessons themselves... They'll surface after I've spent some time away from the project. Maybe then I'll have some sort of enlightenment that I can share. Um, or not. I, uh, I feel a bit naive right now. now. I thought that after I quit work at the office that let its employees bring their dogs in, the one that loaded its fridges with seltzer water and mason jars full of pickled asparagus, cucumbers, and daikon, I thought I'd take a couple months to draft out this book. And then a little later, while waiting on feedback, I'd get a job to fund the project. And then I figured it would only be a few months after that, that I'd be cozying up on my spot on some sort of bestsellers list. Well, it's been those two months and the draft is nowhere near completion. And while hindsight is 2020, I'm still not totally sure why I thought it would only take me two months to do this. I decided to push the deadline back to the new year, which, considering how much progress I've made now, is definitely cutting it close. I just have this dream of me sending it off for feedback on New Year's Eve and then going to White Owl and dancing to Baby Keem's Orange Soda. And you know, if there is an immediate lesson, I'd say it's that without a paying job, whatever money you do have saved up, it has this really annoying habit of seeing itself out of your bank account much quicker than usual. I'm going to start my job search soon. I'll I'll handle that in the coming week. 
For now, I'll soak in my naivety just a little bit longer. Just when I thought the manager with the mule-tailed goatee had pitched the perfect game, something like walking the very thin line on the border of enigmatic and unamused, he said the word, football. As in he described soccer as football, and in doing so, shot goosebumps throughout my body. Bad goosebumps, the type you get if your mom told a group of your middle school classmates that your favorite song was I Kissed a Girl by Katy Perry, that she said, oh yeah, John's favorite artist, it's Katy Perry, that's all he listens to. Something like that. I cringed for him. I, I subscribed to the belief system that if you come from the same country as Kid Rock, you and your vocabulary are to follow suit. You're to only use football when referencing the game played with pads and helmets. And maybe it's my fault. What is it that people say your heroes will hurt you if you get too close? I made that mistake. He was wearing this dated Timbers t-shirt, something that he might've had to fight off a couple of people in cardigans at a swap meet or, or a garage sale just to get. It had permanent stains and holes in weird places. I asked him, I said, Timbers fan? Yeah. You? Of course. How are you feeling about this weekend? Who do we have? Uh, Dallas away, I believe. Yeah, that, I think it's Dallas away. He considered things for a moment before saying, we'll be fine. Are you a big soccer fan? I asked him. Totally. Who do you support? No one in particular. He started the Premier League, Juventus, La Liga. He pulled an espresso mallet from up under the machine and he started to smash the remnants down a platinum cylinder. I just like watching good football. As he broke into a full-fledged monologue, I checked out. A couple names made their way in, Messi, Ronaldo, but everything else was dubbed over. He might have taken it down a completely different route I could not have told you. I just watched as the hair on his bottom lip moved each time he opened and closed his mouth. I saw how he spoke with his eyes closed sometimes, as if lecturing me about how he doesn't have a carbon footprint. He was smug all of a sudden, pretentious. I had to think about keeping a pond of vomit from seeping through my teeth, and, and had someone not walked in to order a sarsaparilla latte, I'm not actually sure if he would have ever stopped. While they ordered... I confirmed that my train of thought was long gone, definitely not coming back to anything productive. And so I slid out the door, hoping the man with the mule tail goatee wouldn't catch me on the way out. My Tinder date stared at me and said, I think you're an only child. So I, I suppose in the grand scheme of things, there were much worse things that she could have said, but right there in that moment and per the question, how many siblings do you think I have? This was bad. This was the worst only child. And she said it with Reber, I, I swear. And then she slowed it down and she took a napkin to the corner of her mouth to shoo away some crumbs. She's right. Of course I am an only child. But who wants to come off as one? The term only child swims in a different lane, but the same pool as the words narcissistic, selfish, and spoiled. And hold, well, so hold on. I picked up the check. I picked up the check and I asked her questions. Questions like why she got that tattoo of a rattlesnake sitting on a bed of roses and why she chose to put it on her stomach. I'd asked her what music she was into and she said rock. And, it, yeah, and in the order of transparency, yes, I laughed a little bit. I tried to suppress it. But has anyone ever just answered rock? Aren't you supposed to say anything but country? Don't you answer that question with a compound sentence? Where was the and or the pause to say hip hop? Nope, just rock. I'm still, um, among other things, I'm still hung up on that. I'm not sure why that was. It, it, it came off like this. The delivery was something like this. What's your favorite food? Pancakes. I reserve the right to acknowledge that maybe not everyone views an only child like that, but for now, I just don't see things that way. And, and it wasn't the end of the world, but certainly it marked the end of the day, right? Why would anyone want to be around someone who supposedly thinks that everything revolves around themselves? But she didn't get up from her seat. Her excuse to leave still holstered, and I might have missed something, missed something, or misheard something. The acoustics at the bar, they were very poor. They, they were terrible. 
but really only one of the few things that I had to complain about. If I'm not mistaken, the original plan for the space it was to be a hangout for restaurant industry workers as it's open late and the drinks are cheap, the food is good and also cheap. The only other area where they went wrong was not charging a cover fee for people whose forearms aren't covered in tattoos, scars, and burn marks, because for some reason, the only types of forearms that seem to show up are blank canvases, ones preserved underneath Oxford blue shirts and company-branded quarter zips, only ever in danger to an unsheathed pen or the sun-baked leather center console of a leased Lexus. You'd be very... Su- well, no, actually, you, you shouldn't be surprised at all about how tacky a room gets when someone in laceless Converse walks in. Still, I've pledged my allegiance because they make the best grilled cheese that I've ever had, and there isn't a close second. I suggested my date might try it. I told her she would feel wealthy eating it. I, I explained how it's only five dollars but after a couple of bites you can't help but pat your pockets for a set of car keys solely equipped with buttons car keys that certainly aren't there when i asked her if that made any sense she tilted her head and squinted back at me in reply and so i didn't push the grilled cheese any further down than that which I think may have been a reason why she never left early. We hung out for five more hours after the bar. We walked around city center for a little, and I I remember us running too for some reason. At 10, we ended up at the espresso bar and bar and grill, where she asked me why so many people wear flannels in town, and to which I replied, I I don't know. That's a good question. There's a lot of trees, I guess. I don't know. I guess those two go hand in hand. That's a good question, though. Do you have a flannel? I asked her. I think so, she started. It's it's plaid? Not necessarily the same thing. I'll send you a picture, she promised. I nodded, then took a sip of what was a then lukewarm lager. She really is beautiful. She really is beautiful. And from what I could tell, I don't think she was wearing any makeup that night. She has tanned skin and and the outline of her upper lip. It sees to the same dimensions of the single line birds I let fly across my drawings in elementary school. And a bit taller than I expected. I guess she was pushing 5'4", but she was wearing boots, and they were boots that had endured. They they showed gray wear at the toes and shaved rubber at the heels. And she wore charcoal gray jeans with rips at the knees and a windbreaker over a white tank top. Her tattoo poked out from under her shirt, and, and she'd spun some of her hair, black hair, in a bun, and, and the half of which that didn't make it hung all the way down a few inches past her shoulder blades. By midnight, we made it back to my apartment, where I decided that she has the perfect nose. While mine is plagued with blackheads and multi-tone from acne scars, hers was smooth, monochrome, like a fresh coat of asphalt that erases all potholes and dibbits. Perfectly proportional, too, you'd be quick to think that she's had some work done on it. When I told her this, she said that she hates her nose, so I asked if I might have it. She replied, I wish it worked like that. Same here, I said. She laughed, but she was giving them away easily all night. And when I told her I moved to Portland because of the show Portlandia, she turned purple and doubled over. And, and when I told her that umbrellas were taboo in town, she chuckled for a minute then asked if I was serious. And when I told her that I could fall asleep while driving her home, she laughed and said, we're almost there. <laughs>